All right, I, I found some headlines. This is, this is what's going on nationally. There's, uh, there's a whole bunch of concern about recession and so forth and, uh, you know, where do we stand? And, and, and it's real simple. Uh, you all know you're going to have copies of all the slides, okay? Right. Don't call me. Call over here at the office. <laughs> And, and they'll make the slides available to you. Uh, Danielle, everybody, the, the slides are yours. Uh, do with as you please. Here's, here's where we are. We, this month set the record in July. We're still July, right? Okay. In fact, I, these poor ladies over here, we're down to the last minute. You know the Fed's meeting today. The Federal Open Market Committee met yesterday and today. They're going to, they're, and with 90, 95% probably going to do another rate cut. I'm, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But we set the record as of July, 121 months and no, you know, a continuous expansion of economic expansion since June of 2009, which was the official designated date of the end of the Great Recession of 08, 09. Okay. It really went on another year, but the economists, it, it only took them 18 months to say that it stopped in June of 2009. Now, that should tell you, economists are not only lousy forecasters, hell, we can't even predict the past. <laughs> so, so, you think I'm joking? That was not a joke. I mean, it did. It took them 18 months to decide that it was 18 months prior that, that the recession ended, okay? But we're at 121 months. It, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, here's the answer. I, I, I told Sharon this a minute ago. We're going to have a recession. When? When? <laughs> okay, there's going to be one. No, I don't know when. I, I have no idea, okay? Uh, uh, in fact, I can tell you, I think I can tell you, that there's five things we're watching. Okay, these are the five things. You want to know what to watch to see whether there's a recession coming or not? Look at these five things. In fact, these five things are kind of the topics I'm going to talk about here in just a few minutes, get in more detail. But jobs and income, demographics, capital and money markets, government and technology. I don't have time to go into great detail on all of them, okay? But they're fairly obvious. Uh, unlike in the 2003, 4, 5 period when you could sell houses and it didn't matter whether the buyer had a job or not, now they ask the question, do they have a job? Okay, and how much money do you make? And can you, can you sustain it? And so forth. The demographics, people. We're going to talk about people a, a good bit, okay? And, and demographics, and I've got some slides and charts and stuff about that. And, and it's not only just the sheer numbers, it's the composition. It's age, it's family status, it's life cycle, because all of those things play a major role in what kind of real estate and land uses get, get uh, uh, used and what they're looking for, particularly housing, but also the commercial sector and others as well. Capital and money markets, obvious. Uh, uh, real estate works on debt, <laughs> like all of us, okay? And, and, and so we have to watch what's going on. Government, you just can't get away from it. It's just, it's everywhere. It's like a disease. It's like the mange, you know? You wish you didn't have it, but you, you're stuck with it. And, and it's at all levels, federal, state, county, city, HOA. I mean, think of an HOA as basically kind of like a government, right? Or a government unit, because it can make rules and it can, it can affect land uses and what you can do with your property and what color you got to paint it and what kind of fence you got to have, right? All those good things. And then, of course, technology, which, which is, is one of the major disruptors right now in a lot of our lives of what's going on. Uh, I left mine in my car, but all of you have a cell phone or a smartphone, right? You can't live without it. I was watching. Virtually 90% of everybody who walked in the door here, one of the very first things you did was you pulled up your phone and started doing this, okay? You look like the millennials, the 18-year-olds out on a date. They sit across from each other at the table, and they're texting each other across the table with their, with their phones. So it's the technology is... is the, so. The key question is, you know, what, when, why, how can any of one or all of these things change, good or bad, and, and then start affecting us? Go ahead. All right, the, the New York Fed, uh, Federal Reserve Bank, actually does a scorecard, a probability on the next recession. 
And this is, this is what it looks like. And you can see that in the last six months or so, or last year, it has really jumped up the scale. <laughs> now, I point out to you, over there on the far left, you see the big, big blip up there on the far left? Well, that was predicting, and incidentally, it's within the next year. It's not like they're predicting it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's sometime during the next 12 months. And, and it came to pass that they, back in 06 and 07, when their probability went up that high, sure enough, by the end of 2007, officially it started in December of 2007, we had the, the great, uh, uh, great Recession and so forth. And you can see it's been bouncing around near zero and then even less than 10% until fairly recently, it's jumped up to about 30%. And what they based that on is they have, a, they have a fancy algorithm mathematical model that looks at the difference between the 10-year Treasury rate and the three-month rate. And that's what it looks like. Uh, this, this is what they're looking at. And the, what they're seeing out there is right out there on the far right, the three-month rate is now greater than the 10-year treasury. In other words, it's cheaper to borrow money for 10 years than it is for three months, which is counterintuitive. Okay? That means it's, it's upside down uh, of where, what you would expect. You would expect long-term rates to be greater than short-term rates. Real simple, if I lent you money and you had to pay me back next week, okay, it's a short period of time for something to go wrong. And the value of the dollar you give me next week is probably going to be pretty close to the value of the dollar I gave you today. But if I have to wait 10 years to get repaid my money, well, first of all, a lot of things can go wrong in 10 years, okay? So there's a risk I don't get paid at all. But even if you pay me back according to what you agree to do, it's likely that those dollars you give me 10 years from now aren't worth the, the dollars I gave you and lent you today. That's called inflation. Okay? So, so as a result, what you have is, uh, th these are called yield curves. Now what this is is the interest rate at different time intervals from uh, three months out to 30 years. See the blue line? That's a normal yield curve. That was June of a year ago. That's what the yield curve ought to look like. At the low end on the far left, short-term rates are lower. Further out the curve, longer-term rates are higher. I know this is getting you a lot of stuff you don't really care about, but anyway, it's important because it's happening. By January of this year, you got the orange line, and this is called an inverted yield curve. Now, it's only slightly inverted, and inverted means it's opposite what it ought to be, okay? That means at, at, you can see that it, there's a dip in the curve where at, uh, at, out there at about five years, uh, three to five years, the interest rates actually go down and dip down and are lower than the shorter term rates. And then here's the current one in June of, two, of this year, the red line, and you can see it's a very much an inverted yield curve. I can tell you that inverted yield curves have accurately forecasted nine out of the last seven recessions. <laughs> okay? It's generally a, a lag of anywhere from nine to 18 months, call it 12, because it doesn't happen ha you know, immediately, but, it, ha but it, it ultimately happens because the financial markets get weird. The money capital markets get weird. Where, where does the money go and how does, it, how does it get invested and what does it get invested in, et cetera, et cetera. The banks are now, they make as much money almost just putting their money into the Fed on reserve accounts and getting paid interest from the Fed as putting it out at risk. Because putting it with the Fed, there's no risk. So they, they, they have these kinds of things. Go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me philosophize a little bit here. That's my prerogative since I have the floor. Uh, the future, the tr we have a transforming future, and this is, and you can feel it, you can feel it here in Austin particularly, okay, we can see it in the state of Texas, we, we see it because we're watching the whole state as best we can, we're not big brother, but we're still watching, and, and two things that are happening, time is speeding up, everything is speeding up, I mean just, it's remarkable, there have been a lot of books on that, and I, I didn't make that phrase up, so, but, but time is speeding up. Everything is just happening so much quicker than you. You know, are you familiar with Moore's Law and computer sciences and stuff? Uh, speed and capacity doubles every two years. When they first came out with Moore's Law, it was like 10 years. But, you know, it's just, it's just so fast now. 
that everything, so if your cell, if that smartphone you pulled out when you first walked in here, if it's more than three years old, it's already obsolete, right? I know because mine's five or six years old and I'm obsolete, but I, I, I stay that way. The other thing, of course, is the globe is shrinking. And, and you're going to hear me bring in from time to time into my discussion here in the next 15, 20 minutes of, of global events. They affect you here in Austin. You don't think about it, but it does. It affects our state. What's happening global? Do you think the price of oil makes any difference in Texas? Huh. <laughs> Well, the price of oil is set globally, not locally. There's nothing we can do domestically, really, to set the price of oil, although now we are the swing producer. I'll get to that in a minute. But, but the price of oil, the trade agreements that are all being negotiated and discussed and so forth, uh, the Mexico agreement, the C Canada agreement, you know, they announced those, what, over a year ago. Do you know that they're not in effect? We're still operating under NAFTA. Senate has not ratified any of those agreements. They're, so they're not treaties and they're not contracts so that we don't have them. What's going on with China? You think, well, okay, what's going on with China? What has that got to do with Texas? Dallas-Fort Worth, for example, is one of the major port cities, believe it or not, in the United States. Do you know who the major trade partner is with Dallas-Fort Worth? China. Not Mexico and not Canada. Mexico, Canada for the rest of the state. So we're seeing all that. Uh, here are the, some of the things to watch, and I, this could be a day or weeks uh, discussion, but innovation and the disruptive roles of what's going on, disruption technology, in your industry especially, you're starting to see it. You're seeing Open Door, you're seeing Zillow, you're seeing all of the online services. How many of you work with a buyer and the first thing they say is, well, I saw such and such online? Or I've searched for properties, and what, what about, you know, 123 Elm Street I saw where it was listed, and you don't know anything about it, okay? These, these are the, the, this is part of the whole disruption, if you will, or the changes that are coming to play just from technology. So, you know, e-commerce, for those of you who do any retail, if you're doing anything with, uh, with uh, retail right now, uh, the retail is going to go through a, a, a mini revolution probably in the next few years, uh, the e-commerce has gone from about 6% market share to about 17% market share in less than a decade, okay? Anybody own Amazon stock? Yeah. It's a good thing to own right now. Anyway, we go, we're doing that. Markets and economic systems. This is, this is economics. There's a lot of definitions, but one of them is, of course, the study of the allocation of scarce resources. Uh, I actually defined economics as the science of taking common sense and making it unintelligible. <laughs> but but, but the, the markets and that, the, 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 there's a congressman that just introduced a, a bill in Congress uh, denouncing socialism. Huh? You, I don't make this stuff up, you know. I'm like Will Rogers. I don't have to sell jokes. All I have to do is just report what the Congress is doing. <laughs> but but, but you, the, one of the things I was talking about demographics, and I think that's the next one on the list here, the millennials and the Gen X, or Gen Z, that's coming up behind, for them, socialism is, doesn't sound so bad. The, the, the idea of Big Brother taking care, paying for this, and so forth, the, the whole concept, and it starts, of course, with the health care was, was a big issue, but, but, but all that, Social Security was the beginning of that. Uh, so it dates back to the 1930s. This is not anything really new, okay? But, but you have to, and, and so the, the distribution of income and wealth and all of these things, how it's playing out, and then our attitude about them and, and what we think about them and how we react and who we elect. Can you imagine uh, Bernie Sanders, as good as bad as he is, depending on what you, and I don't mean to be political, but you know kind of what he, where he's coming from, okay? At least you know where he's coming from. But he's gotten acceptance for a lot of these things. And he's gotten it particularly from young people. So we have to see. Next, uh, Earth, ah, weather and climate. <laughs> Just go outside, <laughs> okay? The counselors of real estate, you know, the CREs, you, you familiar, okay? Generally considered fairly high level. Uh, these, are, these are real professional consultants and so forth, and 
uh, you, all kind of requirements for being a member of the CREs. Well, they came out with a white paper here in June, and they came out with their, their top 10 uh, issues affecting real estate for the next decade, or at least for the next year. Weather and climate was number three on their list. I mean, a few years ago, you would have never thought about it, but, but think about uh, just Harvey, the wildfires in, in uh, California last year, the flooding up in, the, up in uh, Nebraska and the, and the Midwest here, uh, Sandy that hit New Jersey. Well, it really, actually, that's what started. As soon as they hit near the New York area, they got their attention, okay? Because that area of the world thinks they're immune to everything else. But so it, the, the losses that had to be uh, covered, the billions of dollars that had to be covered, the, now the insurance, what do you, what's going on with property insurance? Can you get FEMA flood insurance? Can you, where, where, I mean, there are different areas being affected different ways, and so on. Uh, people, I've talked about demographics, the aging of the population. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm very happy to report that the good guys are living longer. Uh, but, but we are repopulating. We're actually not repopulating. The birth rate right now is less than replacement. Now, man and wife, theoretically, man and wife get married. <laughs> They're going to have two kids to replace themselves, one for each, right? Well, if the birth rate's 1.5, you don't have enough, okay? And that's what happened, for example, in Japan. It's what's happening in China when they went to the zero. India tried, India slowed down, but they haven't made it yet. But, but also the urbanization, the, the, the different uh, things that are going on and so forth. Uh, go ahead. Uh, education. And then government. You can't leave government out of, you know, transforming the future. What, how our government transforms, how it works, uh, where it's going to go. Everybody's worried about national debt and, 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 and rules and laws and so forth. It's all going. Anyway, those, that was, I'm off on left field there. So here we go. Go ahead. Here's where to 2019, national level. Year started out a little slow. If you remember, fourth quarter of last year, interest rates went up, oil prices collapsed. Wasn't good time for Texas. Okay? Actually, the country felt it too. Uh, and, and so down. But by first quarter, GDP was up 3.1. It is slowing down. Second quarter number just came out about a week ago or less uh, at about two, the first number. They do it three or four times. So, okay, give it for the government. It'll take them a while. But at it, it 2.1, so it's a big difference. Spending, uh, personal consumption expenditures, that's what that PCE uh, stands for, is personal consumption expenditures, uh, has been growing. Productivity is up. Labor market is very tight. Average hourly earnings are up to about 3% for the first half of the year. Interest rates since that fourth quarter of last year, you remember when you entered the year this year and, and right toward the end, it was up nearly 4.5% for mortgage rates and sometimes even bumping a little bit higher than that for some. What, what are rates here in Austin right now? What, what's the last one you had? Say again. 3.75, three and three quarter. Do I hear four? Do I hear three and three eighths? <laughs> okay, and, and I know that it varies it, on terms and how much down and, and you know, whether it's 15 or 20 years, all those kind of things. But, but uh, in general, the rates have come back down. I would, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Inflation is virtually nil. In fact, that's, that's the reason the Open Market Committee here this afternoon or sometime today, <laughs> keep watching the news over there for me, uh, is expected to drop the rates 20, and, and it's interesting because in January, most of us were figuring and projecting and anticipating two rate increases this year, another half a percent, 25 percent apiece, increases this year, and now we get in the first rate decline since 2008. It's the first time they've, they've lowered the rate since 2008. So we'll see. Core CPI is down. Industrial production is good. ISM, I mean, we're, we're producing a lot of stuff. That's part of that disruption of technology, though. We're producing a lot of stuff, but we're doing it with fewer people. So the employment base isn't there as much. And now, sort of the good news, U.S. is now the number one producer of oil in the world. We passed the Russia. Take that, commies. And we passed Saudi Arabia. 
And we are now the number one producer of oil in the world, period. And, and the Permian is the number one oil field, oil field, and the Marcellus is what the, probably the number one gas field in the, in the world. And, and that's, it's just going great guns. And, and we have now, to the point, we are now a net exporter of petroleum products, not oil per se, but petroleum-based products, particularly the derivatives, all the tanes and enes, butane, propane, all the tanes and the enes, and I don't know them all. Okay, you've just exhausted my technical knowledge of the enes. Uh, but, but, but we're, and plastics and all of the other stuff that we do and, and produce. And that's important. That's important, it's real important, okay? Uh, on Thanksgiving Day 2014, OPEC met and Saudi Arabia announced they were not gonna support higher oil prices. They were just gonna keep producing because they needed revenue, they needed total revenue. On that day, the global energy market changed. It switched from the Saudis being able to be the primary influencer of the price of oil by changing the volume of output of oil to the U.S., to the fracking industry, the U.S. fracking industry. And the, 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 one of the keys there is the U.S. fracking industry of the major oil producers is the only one that is not state-owned or state-controlled, run by a country. The Saudis, the royal family of Saudi Arabia runs the thing, okay? And they need the money. Russia, it's, it's effectively uh, uh, government-run. Uh, uh, Libya, Iran, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, when it was relevant, Venezuela, but it's not relevant anymore. Uh, and, and, and you can go on down the list. Very, very few. We're, we're basically the only one that's private. And, of course, in the U.S., you can't have collusion in price collusion. <laughs> But it's a global price. The price is set globally. So, okay, they can collude all they want to. It doesn't make any difference, okay? Uh, it, it's not going to make any difference. Go ahead. Here's, uh, here's what I was talking about, late, tight labor market. In March of last year, for, for really about the first time ever, the number of job openings, that's the blue line that comes out by the government, was greater than the official number of unemployed people. There was something like, well, at current numbers, there were 7.3 million jobs available, and there's only 5.8, 5.9 million people unemployed. Now, unemployed government speak. <laughs> uh, you have to be not working and actively looking for work, wanting to work, desires. If you're not working and you're sitting at home drinking beer and having fun, you're not considered unemployed. Okay? Now, if we include those people, there's about 8 million. So, that, you know, it's not as bad as it really looks. But that's, that's the tightness of the labor market. In the construction field alone, there's like 110,000 jobs empty that can't be filled or aren't filled. In Texas, we've got a lot. I mean, in Texas, you know, how did we always fill those jobs historically? Immigrants, immigration. Okay? That's how we fill a lot of the job, particularly the tech jobs and so forth, because you've got to educate people. It takes longer to get there, so you, you bring them in. Not doing it. Go ahead. After-tax corporate profits are basically good. I mean, here are the things that are going on that are good things. It's good news, okay? I haven't hit a bad news yet. I'm going to. But, no, I don't know. There aren't many. But after-tax profits, we live, we have, and we, remember I was talking about economic systems and markets a little bit ago? Well, we have a, a free, open free market capitalistic system of, of sorts uh, that, 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 that runs. And it is extremely important that companies and make a profit. Anybody sitting in this room has got to understand that. Okay? If you don't make a profit, you don't work. Or you don't do it. Your company doesn't survive. Your job doesn't survive. Nothing survives because we operate on that, on that principle. Go ahead. Uh, the small business optimism, this is Main Street America, the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, does a survey. They actually ask about 10 questions about do you think this, do you think our sales up, traffic flow. This is the composite of all of that. And you can see that it, it, it went up. You can see the, big, see the big jump right there about two-thirds of the way over. Yeah, see it right in there, that big jump? You guys over here, the big jump right over here? 
That was November the 10th, 2016. Ring a bell? Yeah. Didn't mean anything. Nothing else happened except the election. But, but all of a sudden, the, the, the optimism went off the chart. Yeah, and the good news is it stayed there. It's, it dipped down, that dip down right there at the right. Well, that was the fourth quarter last year when interest rates went up, price of oil went down. It looked like the economy was going to slow down. Sales slowed down. Of course, it was about that time also that uh, the impact of the tax act got felt by corporate America. And they also discovered it wasn't as good as they thought, but that's a different issue. Uh, corporate America had those big profits, but they weren't reinvesting the profits back into their companies. That was what the theory was on re reducing the taxes, that if, they, if we give the companies more money, they'll spend the money, the capital, in it, reinvesting in, them, in themselves and expand their companies, expand their operations, hire more people, etc. Didn't happen that way. They, they, <laughs> what they wound up doing uh, was paying down debt and buying their stock back. But anyway, go ahead. Here's interest rates. Uh, obviously, real estate operates very heavy on real estate, uh, on uh, interest rates and interest rate movements, what's happening. The black line at the top, that's that 30-year fixed mortgage rate from Freddie Mac. Okay, that's our estimate on what mortgage rates. The blue line is that same 10-year treasury rate, and those are very much tied to each other. In fact, I can tell you, just add about a, a 1.6 to 1.7 to the 10-year rate, and you got the mortgage rate. It's, a, it's that kind of a spread, and it's been pretty consistent over. The green line across the bottom, that's that federal funds rate. That's the uh, interbank overnight lending rate. That's the rate that's going to come out this afternoon, and that they're going to lower about a quarter of a point. That's the one they're talking about. You with me? Okay. And you can see that, that you know, the, the last time they actually cut the rate was back in 08, and then it stayed flat for about seven years at, at near zero. It was effectively zero uh, uh, interest rate. And then started, you can see the stair step look of the increases uh, starting, starting back in about 16 or 17. So, so it started going up, but the long-term rates didn't really necessarily do the same thing. And what, so, so even the rate cut today may turn into a so what? It may turn into a so what? Because here's, this is my, I promise this is my only spaghetti graph. This is the only one with a lot of lines where you got to figure them out. The red line is inflation. It's a change in the CPI. And we are finding, uh, and it's, this is nothing new, this is no new finding, but long-term interest rates tend to follow inflation expectations. Remember I told you it was two things about lending long-term? It was the things could go wrong over time and not get paid back at all. But number two, the value of the dollar you get back could be considerably less than the value of the dollar that you lent in the first place as t over the passage of time. So investors and the markets watch the inflation rate very quickly or very strong and if they anticipate higher inflation in the future then they have to raise current rates if they anticipate lower inflation then they lower rate that's an oversimplification but but it's more or less in general the way the world works okay and what we can see is it's going that way all right let me jump to texas i'm being jumped to texas whether i like it or not no i was ready uh, 2015, 16, we're down years. Why? Price of oil went down. Okay, and I mean it went down a lot. Uh, Percentage-wise, the drop in the price of oil back uh, from uh, 20 right end of 2014 through most of 2015, that drop percentage-wise in the price of oil and the concomitant drop in the rig count uh, was equal to what happened, or even greater than what happened in the 80s. And you remember what happened in Texas in the 80s when we had that kind of a price drop and the, the rig count drop. The good news is, and the, the, real re, the real reason I point that out is the state and our, our local economies have gotten so much stronger <laughs> since those days in the 80s. Uh, our diversification, our economy, we were able to withstand it. Now, it, 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 we felt it, don't, don't go, get me wrong, but we didn't go into an official recession we, we'd lost jobs and, and had some problems, some down years, but, but nothing like what we had in the, in the 80s. You, you all remember how much fun that was from about 86 to about 91, okay? Roughly five years in there. That was, that was a full-on depression in the state of Texas. We had unemployment at near 17%. 
Home values went down on average nearly 50%. Uh, commercial properties went down at least 50%. That's, that's a depression, okay, by any measure. Just, we didn't have, but th this time around, we didn't have 700 SNLs to go broke. We also didn't have all of the major banks in the state except one go broke and, and basically have to be bought out by the New York banks. So we got interstate banking and some other things that, that, that helped. We also didn't have a tax law change that basically killed the commercial uh, field and that, like we did in 1986. For those of you who were around and remember these things. 17, good year. 18, better than 17. And 19 is going to be better than 18. <laughs> Told you, I'm done. Now, the rate of increase, you know, 17 was so much better than 16, and 18 was much better than 17. 19 will be better, but the percentage increases and in all these things is slowing down just a little bit. But that's okay. Hey, we're still going up. We're still going great. Uh, here's, you know, it was a good year. The GDP was up 3.2% versus 0.2% in 16. Okay? I mean, that's the difference there of what I was talking about. Oil prices... Remember, until the fourth quarter of last year, oil prices were over 70. And then they bombed down to about 30. <coughs> so it, we, we see, and they've, since then, of course, rebound. We added about 276,000 jobs last year, which was a 2.3% growth rate. That was actually slower than the year before. And we added nearly 380,000 people one year. And we added uh, 190,000. Births over deaths. Texas is a young state, median age 34.4 years. Only two states in the union and younger. Okay? We also only have about 12.7% of our population is 65 or over. There are only two states in the union that have a lower percentage of over 65. Same two states. Alaska. All eight people in Alaska are younger than everybody here. <laughs> and Utah. Think about it. <laughs> so we had 190,000 people net increase, that's births over deaths. The good news of that is, yeah, we got a young population. <laughs> They're fertile and active. <laughs> but the really good news is <laughs> the older guys are living longer, <laughs> which I am very happy to report. Okay, Us boomers are, are still around. Uh, most people don't know it, but in the state, we actually had percentage-wise more people foreign immigrants than domestic. We had more people move to Texas from out of the country than we did from out of the state. And that, that gets lost in the shuffle. Now, that may shift again because of all of the border issues, uh, uh, the immigration policies, and so on. I mean, we're building a wall on the wrong river, right? We're cutting off our labor supply. Texas, California, and Arizona, and New Mexico all live the south of the water labor supply. We needed to build the wall on the Red River and keep out the Yankees. But <laughs> <laughs> and listen to me. But we have, we have all that, and, and we could have put it on the Pecos River and kept out the Californians, but Austin needs the Californians, so I left that one out. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, Texas Economic Outlook 2019, it's, it's really very positive. Uh, it's going to be pretty strong so long. And the, the, real, the real flying ointment really is the national economy. As long as we don't have a national recession or a, nas a major national slowdown, Texas is going to do just fine. The national economy does not have to boom. The expansion that I showed you, 121 months, it's been, it's been the, one of the slowest periods of expansion, percentage growth-wise of GDP, that we've ever had. I mean, it's just been nich. That's a technical economics term, <laughs> meaning it hadn't been very much. It's averaged about 2.2%, 2.1% a year, as compared to 3.4% a year since World War II. So you get, the, you get, a, you get a relative feel for that. And, and uh, we're, we're seeing this, this thing kind of come that way. But the U.S. economy, and what could happen for the U.S. economy to have a recession mainly would, would be reliant on being a global slowdown, the global economy, because whether we like it or not, U.S. economy is part of the global economy, okay? Can't get around it, it's there. And the global economy really is slowing down. IMF just reduced its uh, projections for the year uh, to be slower. 
the, the, the high growth emerging economies, emerging markets, uh, aren't emerging as much. The, that was the, the BRIC, uh, a few years ago we called them the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Uh, you can always remember the acronyms, okay? That, that helps us people giving speeches, okay? I can't remember all the rest of them. But, but they're, 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 they're doing okay, but like China, I mean, when China only grows half as fast as it was growing, and nobody believes their numbers in the first place, but, but you know that there's a major thing, and that's one, of those, that's one of the big things, thrust for the demand for energy, for example, for oil, is, is, is in China and in India in particular, and in Russia. Now, Russia does its own. Russia's now mad at everybody because, you know, uh, they only have three products. Russia only has three products. They need money. They're, they're broke. Okay? The ruble is not worth anything. The, the Russian ruble, the, the currency. They need hard currency. They need dollars. Well, what can they sell? They got oil and gas. They're, they're number three in the world in oil and gas. And they, they do have almost a monopoly so far on the European market, particularly for natural gas. It was in Germany uh, this summer and was talking to some people out there about that. And, 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 but. The U.S. is encroaching on that. We're now, we're now exporting liquefied natural gas. We're building these big ga gas uh, exporting plants down on the Sabine, down in Corpus Christi. We're going to build, there's two more that are uh, uh, permitted. So we're, we're in, encroaching in that. So we're cutting into their market. They also have, they can sell vodka. And you see, Texas is cutting into both of those markets. <laughs> I mean, Dripping Springs alone, you know. It is cutting into the vodka market uh, big time uh, and, and, America. and the third thing they have though and this is where they're making their money is weapons who do you th where do you think all the Mideast nasties are getting their guns and stuff from so we have that but anyway we're doing fine employment's going to be up two to two and a half percent after 2.3 GDP is going to be up energy sector if we're projecting uh, <laughs> We have an energy expert on our staff, and, and when we were looking at our economic forecast, said, okay, what price of oil going to be? He said, well, it's going to be somewhere between 30 and 100. <laughs> and I said, okay, I could have come up with that. Uh, give me something. So we are looking 40 to 60. And quite frankly, we, on running our actual models, we plugged in 50. Just, and, and that's not been bad. Okay, and I know it's up and down every week and every month and so on, but if you look at it over the last six months, that's not too bad. We'll be doing fine. <coughs> at 50 bucks, the Permian is still drilling. It's not uh, gung-ho, but it does just fine. According to a report out of the Dallas Fed here about eight months ago, uh, the Permian can go down as low as anywhere from 45 to $40 a barrel and still be drilling uh, uh, well, so we'll be doing all right. Population is still expanding, exports are doing well, and exports are about eight or nine percent of our economy. Texas is the number one export state in the Union. We export more than any other state in the Union, so that's important. Very good. That's the reason I was mentioning the trade agreements and so forth, and, and all of that plays a major role in the Texas economy. Retail sales, steady, uh, but not significantly higher. Here's uh, the Dallas Fed's leading index. You can, you can go online and look this data up as well as I can. I'm just putting on a chart for you. But you can see how it dipped. That was that fourth quarter dip out there on the far right. Little dip, but it's come back here in the first quarter. Uh, and the first few months of this year, uh, we'll, we'll see that. I took annual jobs. There's different ways of, of talking about jobs and job creation. What I did, I thought you'd just like to see what's it likely to look like for the next five years. And it won't be on a straight line like this. It just never is. But, but actually, if you look at the trend line, this is annual employment as reported. And I know there are all kind of, we were talking about, somebody was talking to me here earlier before we got started on TWC, the Texas Workforce Commission, and how they measure jobs, and, and it's all blah, blah, blah. Anyway, <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> They change it every March. They revise all of their numbers that they put out the previous year and change them. And I mean, sometimes it's like a 180 degree change from positive to negative. Uh, I ran into, I've run into that. So it, but anyway, it looks like, this is what it's gonna look like. 2018, about 2.3%. Well, what I did is I just simply extrapolated 
and said, okay, if jobs increase on an average of 1.8%, okay, between one and a half and two, okay, so I used 175 and I rounded it up to 1.8. That's how scientific I am on doing some of this stuff. And it's as good as any, okay? I defy anybody, I've, and I've had this conversation now with three different economists in the state that are real highfalutin, you know, they take it out to the 14th decimal place on their computers and everything, and they can't come up with anything better. So, so okay, give it, you know, shoot me. Anyway, it looks like that we'll, we'll grow somewhere around 1.8% a year. We're going to do better than that this year. We're going to do better than that. We're going to probably be, oh, somewhere. Well, I think the current year to date is already at 2.3% according to the official numbers that have already been released, if they stand up, okay? So, so we'll have to see. But at 1.8%, we'll gain about 1.2 million jobs over the next five years. Remember what I gave you that list of five things to watch, right? Jobs and income, boom. We, we're going to have jobs, and Austin is going to get its fair share of jobs. I'll show you Austin here in a minute if I ever get to it. Go ahead. Uh, per capita income, I said jobs and income, here's income, and this is per capita, this is per head, okay? Even your babies, I mean your kids, we count them, per head, per capita. And, and again, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, we've grown about 3.3% a year for the last uh, seven years or eight years, nine years almost, 2009 to 18. So I said, okay, if we're on that kind of a trend, and yeah, I can see the dip back in 2009, that took us down to 36,000, and, and okay, but I picked that on purpose. I said, okay, that was the bottom at, at the recession, at the, at the depth, if you will, of the Great Recession, and what have we done since then? And we've done, Texas has done a remarkable job, better than almost any other state. In fact, I can't think of a, another state that's done better except maybe a couple of the smaller ones <coughs> where the percentages are so easy to change because of small numbers. But, but we have been growing. You can see we had a little uh, flattening out there in 2015 and 16. I've already told you, 15 and 16 were flat years because of the oil price decline. But since then, we've come back up. So I said, okay, if we go up 3% a year, we'll look like that. We're still going to be less than the national. Our per capita income here in Texas is still lower than the national level. We're closing it. If we can go at 3% a year, the national number isn't growing that fast. So theoretically, at some point in time, we come together, but it's still on out uh, a little ways. Texas growth, just to summarize, 2010 to 18, we've gained just about 4 million people, and we've gained about 2.5 million, or just shy of 2.5 million jobs. And if my, my little simple, simplistic extrapolations are anywhere near reasonable, we'll add about another 1.16 million jobs, and we'll add about another 2.2, 2.5 million people. That's a heck of a lot. That's a heck of a lot, okay? Um, <coughs> incidentally, if we add, let's see, two, at 3.8, call it 4, at two, that's 6 million people. That means we added uh, 6, 8, we added 5.2 million cars and trucks. <laughs> and they're all in Austin. <laughs> At least I think so. Okay, and my guess is some of you do think so too. But that's, we're running like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 to 1 per capita on registered vehicles. Okay, so when we add population, uh, in fact, Austin was more than one. That tells you what the students are good for. It was 1.1. Uh, registered vehicle per capita. I don't know how the hell you do that, but anyway, uh, 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 that, was, that was the number. I, a few years ago when I, I collected uh, the numbers. You can see the growth. Here's our projection. We are projecting Austin to slow down in terms of job growth this year to down to 2.3 percent. That's already wrong because <laughs> it's doing better than that so far, uh, but that was what our model, so we'll have to see how the second half of the year comes out. Uh, but you can see how it comes down. Dallas picking back up, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, Texas at about 2.5%, uh, which is going to be really good. I mean, those are, that, that's what our, our magic ball, uh, 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 crystal balls. Actually, I have an eight ball on my desk. <laughs> now, you think I'm joking. I'm not. I, have an, I literally have an eight ball on my desk, and I pick that sucker up all the time. Because I, sometimes I got no better idea than whatever it's going to tell me. 
Okay? It, and about half the time it's, it's out of psychic range, you know, just, just, just no help at all. So we, we have to see. But the, you, the, the state is doing well. Austin's doing well. The 2 3 is probably too low. It's going to be better than that. I don't think it'll be the 3 3 that we had last year. Uh, it, the, the, the tech jobs have slowed down. Uh, all the funny people coming from California are slowing down just a little bit. So we'll have to see how that goes. Go ahead. Okay, oil and gas, energy sector. The dark line is the rig count. And, and historically in Texas, you could measure the Texas economy by just that line. When it was up, the Texas economy was up. And when it was down, the Texas economy was down. And it was almost just bloop, bloop, bloop right down the line. Lately, that's probably given out because of the nature and the technology of fracking and the fracturing uh, industry. Uh, the orange line there is the price of West Texas Intermediate crude. Uh, that was a maroon line until it started going down. I changed it. No, I didn't, but it makes a great story. <laughs> but what you can see is you can see the dip, uh, the big dip back in 15, 16, and then you see the other dip there uh, out on the far right, the fourth quarter of last year. That's that drop <coughs> that we were talking about. But since then, it's come back, and it's been in that $50 to $60 uh, bracket. The rig count, though, is interesting because what's happened is when the, when the rigs uh, peaked out there back in 2014, you got to remember the fracking industry was brand new basically in 2008. The, the technology was there. They knew how to do the horizontal drilling, but they really had never done it because it wasn't economical. It was just, you couldn't make money, right? I told you about corporate profits. Nothing happens unless there's a profit motive. Well, it finally got, price of oil got high enough, you could do it. So then they started trying to do it in earnest. And so you drill down, you drill out, you do your fracking and come up. Well, in 2009 and 10, it was just getting started. By about 11 and 12 and 13 and 14, it was really picking up and so forth. Well, those wells in those days were producing an average of like 60, 70, 80 barrels a day because they were really just learning how to do it. Well, the wells being drilled today are producing anywhere from 900 to 1,400 barrels a day. So you just don't need to drill as many, right? I mean, just the arithmetic could tell you that. <clears throat> also, the technology, they can now put a rig on a track, and they drill down a mile, drill out two miles, and do the fracking. They just literally move that rig over about 25 feet and do the same thing again. So you don't take the rig down and put it back up, which was the old conventional uh, style. So the rig count is probably in the future going to be less significant arithmetically to our economy than what we've had so far. We, don't, we think the price of oil is going to be relatively stable. We're looking at the futures market, the six month, one year, two years out. Right now, the traders, the futures traders, the, the smart guys in the energy trading desk are telling us they don't see any upside or downside on the price of oil. That's, that's what that's telling us. Okay. So until or unless there's something that changes that, then we, we expect the price of oil to have that, hopefully, to have that stability of somewhere between, and I, we, we ranged at 40 to 60. <clears throat> the other thing that will happen is <clears throat> half of those uh, rigs, half of the wells that are being drilled, about half of them are called ducks. You know what a duck is? It's a drilled but uncompleted well. And it's roughly half. We don't know exactly because it, the, the numbers are screwy. We get the railroad commission permit data and so forth. But it looks like there's about three to 5,000 of these suckers. Okay? So their wells have been drilled, the horizontal, but they're not in production. They haven't actually done the fracking. So what happens is if the price goes up, what? You, we, we can go and get our ducks in a row. <laughs> I had to use that line. <laughs> We can get our ducks in a row and produce more oil, which will cause the price to come back down. And then if the price goes down low, we, the, all the rigs that get built, we just make them ducks. We don't produce. Basically, what we're doing is storing the oil back in the ground instead of pumping it out and putting it in a tank somewhere. It's, it's the effective difference. So anyway, that's the, okay, let me talk about Austin. Go ahead. 
the Dallas Fed uh, business index, uh, again, you can go out and look at this data just as well as I can. You can see how Austin has just exploded. And in fact, I can't put the chart for Austin on the same chart with Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, because it's so much bigger. It, it, the, the scale gets all out, of, out of whack. Okay? Uh, Austin has been clearly probably the, the, one of the most economically and uh, rapidly growing uh, metropolitan areas in the country, not just the state, but the country. And as you know, Austin makes all the lists of what, where everybody wants to go and live and so forth, because they all think they're going to live out here in the hills, <laughs> right, on top of one, with Michael Dell as their next door neighbor, <laughs> and, and look down over the rest of us peons while we, while we all starve to death. But that's, I mean, it's, 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 it, that's, it's, it's a great image. It's a great image. Keep it up. Keep it up. I, 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 you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those kind of things. Go ahead. Annual jobs, you can see. Let me just look at the, you don't have to read the individual bars. It doesn't matter. Just look at the slope of how those bars are going up. <coughs> the rapid increase, especially since 2008, 2009, uh, it'll be, again, about 2.3% jobs growth, and that may be low for this year. And we'll have to just see. Go ahead. Uh, monthly jobs and then, and then uh, annual percent change. It's, the percent change is beginning to slow down a little bit because, quite frankly, it's the law of averages and percentages. As you get a bigger base, the percentages decline, even if you add the same number of jobs. Okay, everybody... Arithmetic 101, right? So, so you, it's, not, it's not unexpected. And quite frankly, to get, to get job growth like you've had in the past near 6% or in the 5% at, a, at a, an economy the size of Austin, those are kind of percentage changes you get in towns that are 10 or 20,000 people. And a couple of hundred jobs is like a 5% a increase. You get, that's where you generally see those kind of percent increases. You don't generally see those kind of percent increases in an economy the size of an Austin. So that's phenomenal. I mean, when you have that kind of percentage rate of growth. So to come down to a 2% or a 2.5%, when incidentally the U.S. is like 1.7, is still, is still very, very, very good and, and still strong. So you now the job growth is still going. Go ahead. And there's the percentage changes, Texas, U.S., uh, you know, you can see how Austin has just blown the socks off of both Texas and the U.S. until recently, and, and some of that's coming. So again, some of that is that wave of tech that came in, the expansion of services, uh, all those office buildings that we built downtown, they've been occupied by somebody. I, I, I guess that's what we're going to do with the homeless or something. I don't know. But anyway... Uh, they, they, we're seeing it, but it, it is beginning to kind of come back to reality a little bit, if you, if you get me. Let me talk about people and demographics a little bit. Here's uh, 2010 to 2017 and the changes that occurred uh, uh, this decade uh, by county on the heat map. The red counties up there, those are the counties that have gained the most population, and duh, we're urbanizing, okay? I mean, Texas is an urban state. Despite the fact we have the largest rural population of virtually any state in the Union, simply by sheer headcount, but on percentage basis and so forth, we are very definitely an urban state. We have 26 MSAs, and, and you can see the, the urban triangle, the Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, the I-35, I-45, I-10 triangle is where a lot of it goes. You can see the light-colored counties out west of here, and so on. Uh, number one, that's where there's no water. <laughs> uh, number two, there's no reason to be there in the first place. <laughs> You're 27, 28 years old, you live in one of those counties. You know those areas. You're 27, 28 years old, probably went to college. What do you do? If you're not running the family farm or the family business, what do you do? You move to Austin, you move to Dallas, you move to Houston. And, and yeah, I mean, we can look at that. Uh, those would be the same counties that also have very high proportion over 55. Because if you are over, 40, uh, over 55, you generally don't move. Uh, although, ironically, the, the heavy county, uh, 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 Travis, 
Dallas County, Tarrant County, Harris County also have very high proportion over 65. So if you do a heat map of over 65, you still see the same, same kind of thing. But anyway, 87% of the people live along the I-35 corridor or east. Basically, 9 out of 10, 10 Texans live along I-35 or east of here. Okay? Also, that's where there's water. Minor thing that we all have to have you know, to survive. Uh, something like 90%, 92% of all of the change in the population is going there. The exceptions, you can see Midland out there is uh, uh, a red. Actually, Lubbock and Amarillo do all right. El Paso is getting uh, some, some population change out there. Um, so there are, there are a couple of other changes that come along. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> if we look at... <laughs> If we look at the future from 2010 to 2050, and I did 2010 because that's a decennial year, okay? The, the red line, uh, go ahead and push the next button. The, the red line is if we grew at the same rate we did between 2000 and 2010 and extrapolate that on out, you go along the red line. It would indicate that we're going to gain about 30 million people between 20, over 40 years, between 2010 and 2050. The green line is based on the revised uh, projections that they did last fall. Uh, really, it's based on the, on the head count or the estimates they did between 2010 and 2015 that it indicated, at least for the five years, it wasn't growing quite as fast as the 2000, 2000. You with me? Okay. Uh, so you get, a, you get a slightly different projection. Uh, so we go from 25 million instead of the 54, we go to 47 million. Go ahead. And, and so you get about 22 million people. It's still going to be a lot. If we added 30 million people to our population, how many cars and trucks? About 27 million cars and trucks. Okay. Can you see a pattern emerging of one of the potential real problems we've got in our state? Okay, go ahead. Here's one that I thought you'd find interesting. This is the uh, single year age distribution of the population as of uh, 2018, according to the population. You can see that big bar over there on the far right, that's the 85 plus. You want to know where it's a problem with Social Security? Nobody expected anybody to live that long. In 1934, when the Social Security was created, and they said 65 was the magic age for retirement. And incidentally, there was, there was no magic to the selecting 65. Do you know why 65 was selected? Because in that year, the life expectancy was 64. <laughs> they didn't expect people to live that long. And it hadn't been changed. It hasn't been changed. Well, now to get eligible, now it's up to 66 and a half or 67 or something, but, but basically they haven't really messed with it much. But you can see that's going on. The good guys, the boomers out there, uh, that in 2018 were between 54 and 72, obviously except for immigration for people coming here from out of the country, you can't add to, the <laughs> to that group. So, kind of difficult to give birth to a 54-year-old person. <laughs> I can't even imagine how that would be done. Anyway, <laughs> then you can see the Gen X. That was the fall off. Can you see the little, the little blip there in the Gen X? Where, do you know what that was? That was called Vietnam. For two years, you could get a deferral, tax, a, a draft deferral if you had a kid. So everybody went out and got a kid. <laughs> okay. So that was what that was. And then, of course, you have the Gen Y, the millennials. And there, I, this is my age bracketing, 23 to 38, which means in 2019, they're 24 to 39. Okay, that's, There's big debate about what, what's the first year of the millennial uh, uh, group. But you can see, and incidentally, what I bracketed there is the three highest single-year cohorts in Texas are 26, 27, and 28. 26, 27, 28-year-olds, do they rent or buy? Come on. I'm here. I'm living in. <laughs> by and large, by and large, they're still renters. Because the millennials are being later into the market. When the boomers came through in the early 70s at the same age levels, we were buyers. We couldn't wait to buy a house. And you could, you could buy a house in those days.
for 20, 21,000. I know I did one. Okay? But, but today, it's really, really difficult for a 26, 27, 28 year old who's just getting started really in their career. What is their FICA score? And what is their, what is their student loan debt? Okay? And how do they make, meet the DTI ratio for, for loan class? So most of them, t so here's your future though. These guys are getting older. And the, and the group just in front of them, the, the 30-somethings, the young 30-somethings are now, those are the ones you're, you're get, those are your clients of, the, of, of coming on. Now, the, yeah, Gen X, the problem with, the, with uh, Gen X is, uh, Gen X, uh, I got three of them. <laughs> uh, they're, they're not selling. They would love to, but they, that they're not selling, so you're not getting the inventory. Now, the other thing that's different, and the reason I put this graph up here, you can see the little dip right after the, right after the millennials, and then it picks back up again. Can you see it? Okay, I'm not making this up. Uh, the, they're called Gen Z, just because it's X, Y, Z. I call them Gen I, and the reason I call them Gen I, that's the first generation that's ever been born in the world that will never know the world without the internet. The internet changed everything, has changed everything, and is changing everything. It's, it's probably the number one major disruptor, you know, uh, that's happened in our society in the last 50 years. But anyway, the big deal here is, look how that kind of goes up and stays flat. The national, I, and I did the national thing, is actually slightly down. Okay, reflecting the lower birth rates. But in Texas, it's up, and, and that means what? Education is still going to be a major, major school funding and school financing still going to be, continue to be, for at least the next 30 years, one of the big issues. Um, I use as the example, I've got a grandson, uh, he just stayed with us last weekend, seven years old. And I was thinking about it, and I thought to myself, when he's 27, what's he going to be doing? When he's 27, 20 years from now, what is he going to be doing? What kind of job is he going to have? He's going to be living with you. You're going to be living with me? No, I'm going to be living with him. <laughs> or his daddy. His daddy's in the real estate business. But, but I, and I got to think about it, I said, I, you know, in all likelihood, the job he's going to have may not even exist today. In fact, there's a high probability, unless he goes into the trades, which might not be a bad deal, okay? If he wants to be an electrician, a plumber, uh, what have you, trade carpenter, because we don't have many of those guys. And, and, it's, and they make very good money, make good living. Uh, not everybody needs to have a PhD. Believe me, you don't want everybody to have a PhD. All it is is just piled higher and deeper. You get BS, MS, PhD. Think you can do the the the, the words smithing. But but for Texas, oh, you figured it out. But for Texas, that Gen Z is is increasing. is is a large large component. And, and it's going to be a major issue for us. Go ahead. I, I preached on that enough. 2010 to 2050, here are the same county uh, heat map of where all the population is expected to go. Although, you know, the lines, I gave you the projections. It's exactly what you think it is. Uh, they're going to go to the major metropolitan areas. Again, the uh, 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 urban triangle of Texas is still going to be the most populous and gain most of that uh, uh, gain. I-35 is filling up. I, I was in Williamson County here about six, seven, eight months ago to their, their realtors group and so forth. And I said, uh, no, I'm sorry, I was on uh, Bell County. I was in Bell County. I said, you're next. Because it's coming right on up I-35. It's already come from uh, Travis County to Williamson County. It's going to go to Bell County next. And the search for what? Lower priced housing. Because it, the land costs and so forth just keep going. And it's just going to keep filling in. Uh, uh, many of you remember Henry Cisneros had that, that idea of San Antonio and Austin uh, connecting. He was just 25 years ahead of his time. It's just, you know, he was just too quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Austin, here's, here's similar projection for Austin. Austin going from about 1.7 million in 2010 
to somewhere between 4.5 to 5.2 million. <laughs> I'm going to quit coming over here because I won't be able to get here from College Station. The traffic will be backed up all the way to College Station. Okay. It's going to be, I mean, you got, it's a serious issue. The, the infrastructure, and I, roads are one thing. Uh, but education is going to be one. Water and, and water treatment is going to be a major issue. Uh, all, of the, all of the infrastructure issues that you can think of. It's, it's kind of a good problem to have in the sense if you're growing and prosperous and so forth. It sure beats the alternative because if you don't grow, you tend to die. But, but, but you've, you've got, we've got to figure out our best ways of accommodating the growth and, and, uh, and doing. And you can see even the revision didn't revise it down that much. It's, it's a little slower than the 2000, 2010, but not much. Go ahead. Williamson County is even more. It's going to go from a little less than half a million people to almost two million. That was the reason I told Bell County they were next. Okay? I could see it. You could see it coming. Uh, going on up the line. Even the revision uh, didn't make uh, that much difference. Go ahead. Uh, even Hayes County, the growth is going up and down. Uh, Hayes County going from sleepy 200,000, 150,000 people back in 2010 to close to a million. You tell me, uh, but well, you can, it's the history of the U.S. we tend to grow to the north generally because we put all the industrial uses on the south side of town, which is downwind. So everything went north. But, but uh, it's still kind of that way, and it's, it's closing in and so forth. Go ahead. Let's talk about housing then. Uh, we, have, we have been projecting and, and seeing some slowdown in the housing market and, and trying to figure out why or what's leading up to it and so forth. Number one, and this is particularly true here in the Austin area, is limited inventory. If, if you have a listing today of a house in a decent neighborhood at the right price, can you sell it? Yes. All day long. In fact, probably in less than a couple of three days. Am I right? Okay. And even if it's overpriced a little bit, you can probably sell it, but it may just take a little longer. Now compare that a few years ago when it was typical that it might take 30, 45 days, 50 days to find the buyer, the right buyer, get the contract signed and all that, right? So it's been that kind of, but the limited inventory, we're, we're finding also that there is some price fatigue and affordability, of course, is a big issue. Uh, the, the, and I'll, I'll show you the stats, but, but uh, the, pri the sweet spot here in the Austin market is $200,000 to $400,000. And it's, it's tough to find enough product, just a unit, but then a good one, you know, uh, the, the, that has the market appeal, that has the, the features, the amenities, et cetera, in the location, in the neighborhoods of where the buyers uh, want to be. And so there's some of that. The increasing interest rates, well, that was true at the beginning of the year. And I put that on there because for the first half of the year, a lot of people thought interest rates were going to continue to increase as they did during the October, November, December time period just before the, the turn of the year. And, and the expectations were higher, so people kind of got, okay, uh, nervous. It's working in reverse now. Interest rates are going to have, have come down. You're telling me three and seven-eighths or three and three-quarter here a minute ago. So we're in another, we're back in the world of under four. It, has it made that much difference? If it went to four or four and a quarter, would it make that much difference on the other way? Probably not. Probably not. I don't know where the magic number is exactly. You know, how high do rates have to get before it really has a major, major impact? Best guess, best guess, and it's all it is is guess, is around five. They did a survey here about a year ago of the millennials and said, what do you think the normal mortgage interest rate should be? <laughs> they didn't ask people my age. We just said eight or nine, but the millennials are saying five. So I, we suspect, based on that kind of survey evidence, that the millennials are, are pretty much... Now, obviously, if the rate goes from uh, three and three-quarter to four and a half, 
There are people on the margin that just that extra interest rate, they can't make all of the ratio tests and so forth. There's always that. I don't care what the change is. There's always those people sort of on the razor's, razor's edge. But on an on a overall basis, what they can do is either come up with more down payment or buy a house a few thousand dollars less and then they can qualify. So, I mean, it's a way to work around it, but, so it has some bearing. So we'll see. General economy. That was the reason I started this whole thing this morning. Fear of recession. And it's, 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 it's psychological. It's not real. It's psychological. If people are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs, what do they do? Do they buy a house? Probably not. Do they buy much of anything? No. And in a free market capitalistic system, the absolute worst thing that can happen is nothing. Because it all is based on transactions and people doing things, buying stuff. It is your patriotic duty to go and spend 110% of what you make. <laughs> My wife is the most patriotic American you've ever <laughs> met in your life. <laughs> Stock market has been really volatile. That's the wealth effect. Uh, down payments do make a difference, how much wealth you got, or at least how wealthy you feel. Again, back to psychology. How wealthy do I feel? How, how do I do? And when the stock market is way up or way down, people feel accordingly, okay? Even if it's just on paper. It's not real because unless you sell all your stock, you haven't really done anything. It's just all on paper. But, and that's the reason I don't pay attention to the stock market. Negative press coming off, then press. You love the press. Is Sharon still here? Oh, good. I can speak freely now. No, you're still here. I see you back there. You can't hide. Got to watch the press. Got to watch the press. But, but and you know, I'm talking about the Bloombergs and the CNBCs and the MS and the Fox and all of those guys. You know, the way they get a story on, on the air and get talking heads is to say something controversial or, or exciting or something. Oh, yeah, the world's going to collapse in the next 60 days. Well, that'll get you on TV if you have any kind of name recognition. So anyway, the negative press is not always helpful. Go ahead. Uh, here's what's going on, annual Texas home sales. Yeah, we set another record in 18. We'll set another record in 2019. Things are going great. We're doing fine. We had the big dip <laughs> uh, back in 2015, 16, or, or uh, uh, 8, 9, and then led into uh, 10, 11, and 12. Since then, we've been fine. We, we went even in 16. Uh, still, do, still do very, very well. Uh, prices, the blue line, the red line, that's the average and median home prices. Just look at the slope of those lines since 2011. That's concerning. That's very concerning. Go ahead. Here's what's happening. The red line is the index median home price in Texas. And you can see the blue line is the index median household income. And as all of you know, what you can buy in house is a direct function of how much income you got. And I can tell you, you know, the arithmetic is you can afford to buy a house that's worth somewhere around 3.3 to 3.7, 3.8 times your annual income. And it works, the arithmetic works with a reasonable down payment. And at lower interest rates, that multiple is a little higher, and at higher interest rates, that multiple is a little bit lower. But it works out. Debt service, mortgage payments, relative to income, with a down payment to buy a house, you can do it. In, 19, uh, in 1989, that didn't come out too well. You can't read it, can you? 1989, the relationship between median home price, median home uh, value was 2.65. In other words, in Texas, people were paying about 2.65 times their annual income in home value. You with me on that? In, 19, uh, in 2017, that multiple was 3.76. Magic numbers. Uh, th that price income uh, multiple is a, is a pretty good multi uh, uh, indicator of general affordability, okay? Generally, when that number gets north of four, you start getting in real trouble. When it gets north of four and a half, you are in definite trouble. In California, during the housing boom, people were paying as much as 15 or 16 or 17 times their annual income to buy a house because the price of housing got so high. That don't work. And it doesn't take a genius to figure that out, that it don't work. It works only if the price of the housing and the value of the house is going up about 2 or 3% a month. <laughs> then it'll work. 
But other than that, it, it doesn't work. And, and of course, it came home to roost. So we're watching that very, very carefully. Nominal household income uh, has increased. I showed you the per capita income earlier and with the projection up. Median household income is going up. It's still not going as fast as home prices, though, at about 3% versus 5%. Rough numbers. Go ahead. Uh, Texas inventory is still low. It's a, it, it has gotten back up to a little over 4%. We use six months, six and a half months as the magic number there, as a benchmark number, if you will, uh, to kind of compare. It's still very low, still, uh, still uh, <coughs> oh, I got the arrow pointed in the wrong place. It's a seller's market right there when it gets out of the, the balance market area. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, still quite low. Go ahead. Trying to get us here's 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 a biggie that we just had and we're having still an argument in the office uh, as late as yesterday afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, our projections and our numbers are indicating that new home construction this year may be down. Year to date is already down about five percent, based on building permits issued statewide <coughs> for single family, single family. So we, we, our projection for the year is about a 5% decline. What we're just not sure of is if, if the interest rates do indeed come down this second half of the year, and maybe we start approaching a 3.6 or even a 3.5% mortgage interest rate, if that will buoy up the new home market enough to get the home builders to build more. What the home builders are telling us is, I would build more, I'd be happy to build more because I can sell them if I can build in the right price bracket, right price group, and, I, and in volume. I can't find lots that are priced at the, at the right amount so that my final building product, okay? It's roughly a six to one or five to one. Depends on what percentage the lot is of the final price. But it just at five to one, if you have a $50,000 lot, that means it's a $250,000 final product. Where can you find a $50,000 lot? They're like 80 and $100,000. Well, 100,000 times five, it's a half million dollar final product. That's, that's problem number one. Problem number two, I can't find roofers, framers, masons, uh, plumbers, electricians, I can't, I can't labor. I, I talked to a builder not long ago. I said, well, you know, five years ago, how long did it take you to stick build a house? Five, seven months. What is it today? Nine to 11. And most of that is simply the slowdown because you can't get the crews out. Where he might have used to have a crew of eight or nine or ten framers to frame the house in a few days, now he's lucky to get a crew of two or three. And God help him how good they are. <laughs> okay, so we're we're having those kind of issues. So it's not unreasonable that the slowdown may be occurring. It's not the market demand. It's it's more the other side uh, of the equation. Go ahead. Multifamily slowing down a little bit. It's, it's still high. You can see it's well above a long-term average for number of units. That's because we're still young. We've got all these millennials, all those 26, 27, 28s. They're still renting a lot of apartments. And here in Austin, people rent apartments just, to, just for the hell of them. <laughs> or for the seven days, seven Saturdays a year when they want to come to town and go to a game. Okay? Or they buy the condos that are being built downtown. Uh, so you find that. I, it, it's really interesting and going on. Go ahead. Our, our leading index, residential construction index, that's the red line and all of this, uh, would indicate that there is going to be a fall off. That's again why we were projecting for the rest of this year that the second half of the year wouldn't be enough to offset the first half of the year with the downturn and, and probably have some slowdown in single family construction. Our leading index is telling us. Uh, that it's, it's a complicated formula based on a whole bunch of other stuff. Go ahead. Let me talk about Austin. I knew you, you, you've you been here stand, sitting here for almost an hour now for bated breath to hear me finally get to Austin, right? All right, let's talk about And I'm talking about the MSA, so all of the data that you're going to see, un, until unless I tell you specifically it's something else, uh, relates to the MSA. Go ahead. This is something you should be familiar with. I know it's impossible to read. I don't have any control over that. Texas Realtors decided on the color combinations. 
But this is the quarter annual, or the, uh, the annual, the quarterly uh, housing report for Austin, Austin Round Rock. Of course, you can go out online uh, to the uh, uh, website for TR and pull that up. You can see the median price for the quarter relative to second quarter of last year uh, is up 3.1%. Listings actually are down nearly 3%. That's not a good number. Uh, you need more. You need more listings. In Aggie speak, you ain't got none. <laughs> okay, so so we got to we got to do something with that. Closed sales are up nearly five percent. Months inventory is actually uh, uh, down a little bit to two point seven. That's because the listings are down a little bit. Uh, uh, you can see the bars up there. I got a better graph for that. Uh, I'll show you here in a bit. Here's what you can come to expect. And your, and, and your marketing here, huh? You got one of those? Okay, you got a subdivision like that? Yeah, well, this happened to be San Francisco, but, but uh, and I, I did that. I, I used this about a year ago in, at the TR meetings, and, and uh, sitting next to me was a broker from San Francisco who was the NAR rep that year. And I sat back down, I said, sorry about the slide on San Francisco. He says, oh, that's no problem, it was too low. <laughs> he said, I'm not, I can't find anything under two million. Okay, so I mean, we think prices are high, right? We think prices are high because you're used to what's here. You're used to the history here of Austin. Austin, sleepy little town through the 60s, through the 70s, in the 80s even, then started picking up in the 90s, and now in the 2000s, it's no longer sleepy little town, okay? So by comparison to the history of Austin, Austin, the prices seem high. 330 something thousand for a median price seems awfully high. Compared to the rest of the country or comparable communities like Austin of high desirability in the, in the million and a half to two million population range, et cetera, et cetera, very, very much competitive, very attractive actually in terms of general price. Why do you think all these Californians were very happy to come out here, okay? They sold their 1,500 square foot shack for two million bucks in Silicon Valley or wherever they were, and they come here and they're, they're, this is Nirvana, okay? So it's, it's kind of interesting. Go ahead. Annual home sales, again, just like everywhere else, you had the dip in 2008, 9 Everything's been up since then. Again, the, the pace of increase, you know, varies from year to year and so forth, but doesn't do too badly. Go ahead. Uh, months inventory. I mean, you're running less than three months. Again, in Aggie speak, you ain't got none, okay? You sure don't have none. And actually, it's, a, it's an anachronism. How can you have such low inventory and keep setting sales records, having more sales? Are people having to buy things whether they like it or not? Because they don't have enough selection. They, so it's either buy what you got. You know, it, it's like going to the car dealership and saying, all you have is what's on the lot. And it's sort of take it or leave it. Well, it's kind of the same way here. People looking to buy a house today, there's such a limited inventory, in particularly in select neighborhoods and in select price uh, categories. It's kind of take what, what we've got here or don't, okay? And so we're, we're seeing that uh, come in. Here's the distribution year to date for the first half of 2019, 60%, 61% of all the sales that were reported in the MSA we're between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars. So I call that your sweet spot. Okay, if I can find a house in the two hundred four hundred thousand price bracket, in a reasonable neighborhood in reasonable shape, I probably should be able to sell it and sell it fairly well. Is that true? Do you find that to be? Now again, this is the whole MSA. So this is Hayes County, Williamson County. You know, it's not just in the city or or just in Travis County, but the whole the whole market. But look at the month. Well, Look at the month's inventory, the green bars. I don't know if you can read them uh, very well, but what I'll tell you is that between uh, the 200 to 400,000, it's all less than three months. In fact, it's close to two and a half months or even less than two months in the case of 200 to 250. Again, it's just that, that's what I'm talking about on the, on the limited inventory. Even down to the most expensive, down there to 750 to a million and a million plus. Normally, million plus, that, that month's inventory, the benchmark for that would probably be 12 or 13 months. Because higher end properties, more expensive properties just simply don't sell as quickly 
because uh, it's such a slimmer slice of the market. And the people are just more demanding. If you're going to buy a house for a couple of million bucks, you're going to be a little bit particular, you know, about where it is and what it is and so forth. So months inventory there. So at eight and a half months, that's pretty tight for that, for that particular market there. That's, that's kind of interesting as well. Now go ahead. Uh, median home price has been shooting up. That's no secret to anybody sitting here. Here's what it looks like. This is the annual, annual number if you plot it out on the monthly. There is a seasonality. It's highest right now. It's lowest in Jan December, January, February. There's a seasonality factor uh, that plays both on sales volume and on prices. Uh, we're looking for about 2% increase uh, after about nearly 4% last year. So again, it's moving up. Uh, one of the reasons it's being kind of held back is some of the home builders on the new home market are, are finding out they can go further out and build the $150,000, $300,000 house. So the median, which is the midpoint of the distribution, will be affected, and the average will come down also. It's, it's uh, how, how economists lie with statistics. And we're real good at it. Go ahead. Uh, Williamson County, home sales uh, leveling off uh, up about 1% in 2018. 2019 probably be leveled to slightly up again. Uh, plus or minus 1% is essentially saying flat, but it's flat at a record level, at a high level. Go ahead. Home prices in Williamson County uh, popping on up. They're going up, you know, when you're going up 9, 7, 6%, 11%, 11%, those are healthy, healthy, healthy price increases. And it, it, it's not sustainable at that level for very long before you really have a problem and it starts leveling out a little bit in terms of percentage rate of increase. It's up over 60%, or right at 60% between 2011 and 17. Go ahead. Uh, Hayes County, uh, not as fast as Williamson County. That's no secret. Uh, different reasons. But, but the land costs are a little less down there, so builders are beginning and, and people are beginning to see that uh, down there. Go ahead. Uh, current month's inventory, though, I, I hope you caught that, was less than four months. Uh, 259, almost 260 uh, for median home price last year in Hayes County. I mean, that's unbelievable, considering it went from 160,000 just a few years ago. You know, it's up 100,000 since 2011. Uh, so we, we see that kind of thing. Go ahead. Here's a heat map by zip code uh, in, the, in the MSA of, of on the left side, uh, sales rate of change uh, June of this year to June of last year. The right hand uh, map is the price per square foot. We're finding price per square foot to be a better measure than either average or median. So we're, we're looking more, more at price per square foot, particularly the measure. And you can see on the right hand side, the prices, there's a whole lot of green, mostly green, so that means they're up. And the prices, of course, are up nearly are about uh, uh, 2%, but they're up kind of uniformly. The sales, uh, the pace of sales is up a little bit uh, on a year-to-date basis, but you can see how the mix is by area. And you probably know these areas better than I do in terms of where these are and what the, what the changes are looking like in terms of change. Go ahead. If we look at just Travis County uh, by zip code in terms of sales, can you see the blue dots? Can you see them? Those are the actual sales. That's a plot of the actual sales, at least the best we can do on the scale of the map. Uh, so you can kind of, you, you get a pretty good handle of how it's going right up I-35 and then to the west. It looks like to the east of I-35 is slowed down. Uh, and that's the reason out there toward Bastrop, it's uh, uh, the red area. Go ahead. Sales in Williamson County coming right on up 35 up through uh, uh, Round Rock, and then on up to Georgetown. And you can see it, it uh, also trending more off to the west of I-35, where the green area is, looking at the distribution of the dots. Sorry, I'm standing in it. I, I do that on purpose to stand in front of everybody. You know. I try to be an equal stander in front of. Get this side of the room, too. Go ahead. Uh, average price per square foot, Travis County, you can see it's almost all green. Uh, with just a, the, a couple of exceptions. Uh, again, uh, the, the white in there means it's flat, didn't change, and that's just year-over-year year rate of change. Go ahead. 
And then in Williamson County, it's a very similar picture. So you get, a, you get a feel for, hey, this is going on pretty much. You know, these are our two principal counties. I, I know Hayes in there. I just didn't want to overburden you with too many. You look at this long enough and you go blind. <laughs> I know. I put them together. So, so go ahead. The, the commercial real estate market. Uh, I don't know how interested you are in this, so I'm going to do it pretty fast. Go ahead. Uh, in terms of industrial and warehouse rent rates, uh, that's Austin is that top dark line. Uh, rent rates for, for warehouse industrial space uh, going up very dramatically uh, in this area. I-35 corridor, uh, a lot of the high tech and so forth coming in here. Go ahead. Overall office rents also. Uh, reflecting somewhat the shortage of office space that, uh, when there was the boom in the need for office space here in Austin. So the rents uh, tended to take off and go up higher. And this is uh, asking base rental rates <coughs> for the overall market. It's not just the Class A, it's everybody. Go ahead. Retail, retail has been strong uh, here in the Austin market. In fact, under, under retailed, if, if there's such a phrase, uh, <laughs> Uh, if you look at retail space per capita and so forth, uh, it's, it's lower than in other areas, so it means it's a tighter market. Also, retail tends to be, of course, very locational. It's, it's called a derived demand market because it, it derives from rooftops, it, from people. Uh, so we, we find that a lot of the new development, newer areas being developed with residential, the retail is a year or two behind it uh, because you just can't get there fast enough. And also, all the same problems, labor shortage of commercial uh, con contracting, con uh, construction, and so forth. Go ahead. Class A office. Uh, Class A office has become more expensive here in uh, relative terms uh, uh, than even Dallas or, or Houston. Go ahead. Here's our projection. This is something new from the Real Estate Center. You're the first people who've seen these numbers because uh, we just came out with them like four days ago. Uh, we are now doing projections on the commercial real estate market by metropolitan area. This is Austin. Uh, what you'll see is for apartments, we're projecting uh, from 2018 to 2019 that the uh, vacancy rate will drop from 8 to 7.4 percent. That's part of that demand from the young people moving into the apartments and some slowdown, a little bit slowdown on apartment construction. The 2020 numbers, they're there for what they're worth. I'm not even going to mention them. We're looking at uh, asking rents to go up about 4%. This is across the board. This is all apartments. So it's, it's the, it's the total, total market, not just the Class A or just the Class B. It's, it's, it's all of them. Office space. And incidentally, over there in the very first column, you see a thing called natural vacancy rates. We've been doing a lot of research in, in the commercial real estate field, and we find that there is a an effective, we call it natural vacancy rate, long-term vacancy rate. And it tends to be when, it, when, it, when the actual or the current vacancy rate gets way above or way below that natural, that tends to dictate whether there's going to be more or less space built and whether rents are going to go up or down. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a way of measuring it. And I'm showing you that, for example, apartment market, the natural vacancy rate's about 8.3. Well, if in 2019 it's 7.4, that's going to encourage more apartment development and higher rents because it's saying that the, the vacancy rate is lower than what the, the, the long-term rate would indicate it ought to be. Same thing for office retail and warehouse space. Uh, we're looking at uh, office space to actually increase a little bit in vacancy rate to 10.3, but it's still, still less than the natural. 4.4 uh, for retail. Retail's tight. 4-4 uh, vacancy rate versus 6 natural rate. That's a tight market uh, for retail space. So uh, accordingly, the rents we are projecting are going to go uh, actually down because the retail market shifts. What used to be the prime retail all of a sudden doesn't become prime because all, you got all the new development that's, that's taken all the purchasing power somewhere else. Weird market. And then finally, the industrial market going. I wanted you to see that. I know most of you probably are in residential. This is not your primary area, but you can see what, and also is my commercial for the real estate center to get, to get it out, that we're doing this now. This is something brand new. And, and there is a quarterly report. I think it goes online next week, and you'll see these numbers with more explanation uh, behind them. Go ahead. I think that was it. Yeah, I'm done.
Sure. I even finished 10 minutes early. So I want that to be noted. <coughs> Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <coughs> ah, okay. Affordable housing. We're going to have to address it. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> Affordable housing is going to be one of the number one issues in the state of Texas for the next 25 years. We're going to have a lot of problems. It's nationally. It is. It is. And it's, it's more of an income problem. When you think about it, it's an economic income problem more than a uh, housing problem. Can we produce housing in price? We can. Actually, our cities won't let us. No. Okay? If you keep restrictive exclusionary zoning and you do some other things with, and you get those land costs like I was talking about, you can't build any new. So then you have subsidized housing. Well, we, can't, we don't have enough money to subsidize all the housing. So yeah, very much so affordable housing is a, is a pressing issue. We've been studying, we've been looking at it a lot. We, we've come up with some recommendations of things to do. Uh, it's going to take flexibility and political will. And, and those are two things that don't necessarily always, always go together, okay? Uh, a lot of verbiage, a lot of hyperbole with it, but not necessarily when it gets down to cases, the actual thing. Uh, Minneapolis, any of you aware of it? Minneapolis just did away with their exclusionary single family zoning across the town. That now in, in areas that were formerly single family only, you can go one to four units. So it's, it, you know, and they're experimenting. They're not sure whether it's going to work or not, but that was one of the things that they were trying to do uh, to get it. Density. Uh, home builders will tell you, I can build a $200,000 stick built house if you'll let me do it on a 30-foot lot <laughs> and, get a lot, and get about 10 units to the acre or 12 units to the acre. Others? Yes, ma'am. So I have a few, but uh, I've always heard that Dallas is the bellwether for all of Texas. And Dallas last year had a reduction in year-over-year -year sales by a little less than 2%. Couple percent. And then year-to-date in Dallas, they're down 2.3. In June, they were down 10.9. And as Dallas being bellwether for Austin specifically and San Antonio, how does that look for us since they've seen about six plus months of decline? It, it is a concern. Uh, it, it is a concern. Again, much like what I was saying here for Austin, when you get into the Dallas, uh, when you get into the numbers, you find out that the, the decline in the sales volumes and transaction is more from limited supply than actual fall off of demand. People are still trying to buy houses. They just can't find them. And the pricing has gotten they, they, they have the same kind of price points you do, and you can't, they're harder to find in Dallas. And then um, I've always heard that condos are the canary in the coal mine. They're the first asset class to go down. When the market goes down, the last to go back up. Um, yeah, they're down. Today, here in Austin, they're down about 6.5%. So, right. so I'm kind of seeing these things that are saying, hey, we're raising a yellow flag here. Just want to get the, you the Austin condo market has been interesting because it's a mixed market between owner occupants and second home buyers. So many of the condos that have been bought and sold here in Austin are not necessarily by people who are going to live in the condo permanently. They either rent them or they buy them for their kids to go to school in, or they're buying them as a second home for they come to Austin for whenever they want to come to Austin. So it's a mixed, mixed bag in there. And you're right. Statistically, if you watch the condo market, it, it generally, when it goes down, it'll go down and up prior to the other markets. I, what else can I tell you? I, you know, it is a concern and something to watch. I, I wish I could tell you a more definitive answer. I, I don't have one. Hi, um, I was hoping you could talk about the census in 2020. I've been reading a lot of predictions that we're going to have an undercount in Texas because we're not putting any money into it. You talk about all the people coming, right. the infrastructure. I mean, what are we going to do if we're losing out on hundreds right. of millions of dollars? Did everybody hear the, hear the question? Did you guys hear it? It's a 2020 census. Uh, incidentally, the, the Texas Realtors Association has asked us at the center, uh, what can we do to, to write an article or foster? Everybody go get counted. <laughs> it's it's sort, of the, sort of the thing. Texas has a lot of illegals. We don't know, nobody knows exactly how many illegals there are in Texas. It's not known. 
But they don't tend to want to get counted because they don't tend to want to draw attention to themselves. It is extremely important because that is going to be the allocation of resources that's going to happen uh, for funding for things. Uh, congressmen, and uh, not senators, you only got two of those things, uh, but you've got all the, con the number of congressmen is based on population. It is extremely important to get counted and to get counted in your local community because your local community, as you point out, is going to get funding, particularly federal funding, but also state funding based on head count and, and so forth. So I don't know how to say it other than, you know, it's, it's extremely important. If you have any influence on anybody, just make sure that they, they get counted, however they're going to get counted, and respond to the, the questionnaires. How are, we going to get, how are we going to count people that don't want to be counted or don't want to have anything to do with officialdom? Right? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and that's a problem. And I have, I have no idea what the cure is. Uh, but I can say that we need to foster it as best we can. Uh, in fact, what, what the big debate was whether they could ask the question if you're a citizen or not. Well, and and I, think, I think it has come down now they can't answer, ask the question, but it keeps going back and forth. And so I admit that I, I lose track of it every once in a while, and they'll find another judge somewhere else that'll say yes, and another judge somewhere else will say no, that kind of thing. It's one of those things. But it, it, excellent point. And, and from the realtor's standpoint, that's a critical issue for this year, or for this coming year, for 2020, is to get as good a count, as accurate a count, and as complete a count as we can. So I work primarily in a neighborhood that's just a few miles from the new Apple campus or the one that's been announced, right? So everybody there thinks that their four hundred thousand dollar house is gonna be worth a million dollars in ten years. Sure. And maybe more importantly, they're immune from or isolated from any type of downturn. What would you say to somebody in that situation? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I you know, we have seen that kind of influence before. And it and sometimes it comes to pass. That, that all of a sudden the area that was there and something comes in. Because obviously, you build a big campus like that and, and so on and create jobs in the area and people want to live there, you've just created a reason for people to be there and they'll bid the price up if they can, okay? The price will be bid up primarily from people coming from outside, maybe than, than the people that are already here because they're already established. Um, will it always happen? Will it happen to every property? Will it go from... $200,000 houses to million dollar houses, it, you know, you just have to see. I'm sure the builders are trying to buy land and build homes. I'm, try, I'm sure commercial real estate guys are trying to build shopping centers and whatever they can out there. And, and then the peripheral around the, the campus itself, because there's always the spillover, it's the externalities is what it's called. Uh, from the, the development that go to the surrounding areas. Just like uh, 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 40, 50 years ago is when you built a regional mall somewhere. And within 10 years, the whole area around it completely transforms. That could well happen. Are they insulated enough? As long as Apple is real, doesn't, doesn't change their mind again? Yeah, it could happen very easily. So I have one last question for you. I'm over here. Oh. Um, you represented the Texas Realtors this year by going to Cannes, France, and the largest international real estate conference. Yeah, that's right. I'm a little. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Your experience and what you learned? Yeah, it was it was uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, the 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 conference was held in the same facility where they have the uh, film festival. Area. The film festival was in May. This was in March. So we were cold. First thing I can tell you is southern France gets cold, okay? And, and if you're there in early March, you take a jacket, take a coat. My wife was in her. You knew I wasn't going to be able to go without her. So, you know, take, take your big coat. But the conference was interesting. It was an, it's an international commercial real estate conference. The majority of it is the, the areas, uh, cities or states or whatever, promoting themselves like economic development, trying to get people interested, developers interested to come to their areas. Uh, 
we were there representing Texas, uh, the Texas Realtors delegation. I think there was eight or nine of us. Uh, we, we were part of the NAR, National Association of Realtor, uh, wasn't a pavilion, but it was an area. It was about uh, a quarter the size of this room, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. It was a relatively small area, and there was about seven states. We were there with Missouri and New Jersey and, Los and uh, California. San Diego had their own place, um, and I'm leaving out two or three others. Uh, promoting the state, we, we had uh, meetings with uh, pension fund advisors, investors, uh, three Koreans. The Koreans are very active uh, uh, in looking of where to go so they can get out of Korea, I guess. Um, we also had two Scandinavian, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, I can't remember now the exact countries, but that area of the world. Again, two pension funds represented uh, looking for investment. U.S. is, you know, real, uh, despite all the geopolitics going on, uh, from a business standpoint, the U.S. is still very attractive. Yields are good. Real estate is good. We're much easier to deal with in general than most other countries. Uh, if you want to come here and buy an office building or, or an industrial facility in the United States in Austin, that's a, it's a lot easier deal to put together than maybe going to some of the other countries in the world. Um, we got a chance to see other areas. I got, I got to take a quick uh, uh, anecdote. Uh, Moscow had a, had a display in a room about, it was bigger than this room. I mean, they had a whole pavilion. They had a map of Moscow on the floor. And there was this lady giving an, a lecture in Russian, so I have no idea what she was saying. <laughs> but evidently, she was going over uh, the infrastructure plan for the city of Moscow. And, and we were standing there, and all of a sudden, <laughs> a reporter comes up and shoves a microphone in my face and wants an interview from Moscow TV. <laughs> so I became an instant celebrity on Moscow TV <laughs> as the most, and I didn't know a damn thing about what they were doing. <laughs> oh, is this going to be a good thing? Are we going to do that? Hell, lady, I don't know. Yeah, no, I didn't say that. I, oh, I made it sound good. I mean... I just thought it was funny. Uh, London had a big display. The, the payback on this is expected to be over the years. It's not, it's not that kind of a kind. There were 29,000 attendees. Give you an idea of the size. Okay. Uh, uh, security. You had to go through the gates and so forth, uh, get your bags. It occurs to me that, you know, all the security, if we just all went nude, we wouldn't have to do that. But anyway... <laughs> Did I hear agreement? <laughs> I'm not sure I in, enjoyed the image of it, but anyway. Uh, so, and it was huge, uh, all of the displays and so forth. So we were there. We were just learning. We, this was the first time I think TR had ever, Texas, TR, Texas Realtors, uh, had ever done something like this. We're going back again this coming March. Uh, and, and, and we have a better idea now of who to talk to and what to say and what questions to anticipate and so forth. First year, man, you're there. <laughs> and I was the token economist, I mean, because I'm not in the business. You know, I don't have a dog in the fight, per se, uh, doing this. But, but it was mostly commercial, so the, it wasn't, re except for residential development. We had two master plan uh, uh, developer types. Uh, they were at, both out of England. Uh, and of course, the questions they were asking the, the, reflected their, they didn't understand the, the U.S. way of doing something versus, because they kept saying, well, doesn't the city have to tell you this? And the city, no. <laughs> you know, once you get through the city's plat permitting, you, you, you know, you're, you're done with them. Uh, you know, and, and they, they couldn't understand that because evidently in England, to do anything like how wide the doors are is directed by somebody, some official within the city and so forth. And I'm making that up, but, but it was that kind of thing. But it was, it was very interesting. It was, we hope that there will be feedback and positive. We, we talked about Austin. Uh, uh, we actually had a small group of people. We had two, two, two ladies. We did, I we, we did sponsor part of the Texas yeah, Ventures yeah. to represent Austin 
for they were there. Um, for the Austin Bird Realtors. So we did have a delegation there. Yes, ma'am. Um, so great. So Austin was well represented. I want to have everybody help me thank Dr. James.